back to it, everybody, here tonight. We're going to work on our uh, second podcast-style type episode where I'm just talking to you guys as we watch some of the old footage. Now, I did not leave any of the sound from the old footage or anything like that because it's a little bit distracting for me to uh, try to record a voiceover and then listen to all that at the same time. Plus, sometimes, you know, I don't know how well it gets the message across. So... We've been gearing up for the next Timber Frame project, so we're revisiting a lot of this stuff because, quite honestly, I need some review myself. So what you see me doing here, this was where I really started picking up the Timber Frame project on camera. You can see I already had three bents built and stood by the time I really started running the camera. And uh, so we started with a lot of our tie beams cut, things like that, and... Yeah, you guys who've been watching a long time kind of know how it all went. Now that second bent back, that is the one that was actually um, an inch and a half too long. That's the one that we had to repair in the middle of winter time with it all stood because I noticed it when I ran a string up above. So the repair wasn't too bad. It um, it looked a lot worse than it was, but you guys will see that later on as we go through these again, or if you've been watching a while, you have already seen them. Now that machine, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the channel, that is a used chain mortiser, a Makita that I picked up um, oh, a few years ago. Well, actually not too long before this video was made. Now a used chain mortiser, this one ran me about a grand. It came from Europe. It said it was coming from uh, Delaware, I believe, so I thought it was actually in the U.S., and it actually came from, I want to say, Denmark. Now, that uh, that chain mortiser was a 7103 model, not the 7104L model that I thought it was, that the listing kind of said it was. So I had to revamp the clamping mechanism on that to make it wide enough so I could fit these 10-inch wide timbers and that clamping mechanism has been the bane of my existence. Um, I would like to try to find a 7104L clamping mechanism and replace that entire bottom portion. That would make my life so much easier. The, uh, the arms and everything on that are pretty worn out, and that's mostly for me revamping it to where I can use it. Unfortunately, some of those parts are not the easiest to find. But I will say that that chain mortiser, even though it had its issues, was worth every single penny I spent on it. It saved me days worth of labor on this project. I, I was able to cut mortises minutes versus hours. It just It's an amazing tool to have. I think the Moffle ones, if I'm saying that right, are quite a bit better because they actually cut against the grain not with the grain the makita chain mortiser kind of has a tendency to jump around if you don't have it clamped well just the way it digs into the grain but the uh, the mouthful one the only thing i could see that maybe i wouldn't like about it is it looks like for the different mortise widths you're actually going to be changing that bar and chain out quite a bit and i will tell you the chains for these makitas are probably the most expensive part of the machine. I believe they're right around 600 bucks for a new chain. It's insane. But that one particular chain did this entire project. It's still plenty sharp. It's good carbide teeth on it. Obviously, we're not running into old timbers with nails and things like that in them. Uh, these trees came from deep in the woods, so I didn't have to deal with any nails or posted signs or any of that stuff. So we got pretty lucky there. Now that's a big thing when you're using using a chain mortiser. Uh, Jim Rogers has a few pretty good instructional videos on how to set them up and how to use them. And uh, I guess when you're you're using them, you just want to be careful not to go over your lines. I, I like to leave the line and then chisel to the line. That's usually the standard practice in most of your timber framing. It just makes it a lot easier for accuracy. Now, we've said before, we've talked about when you're doing your mortise and tenons, how you kind of want to leave them. You just, well, I, I guess the best way to describe it, leave the line. I'm having trouble collecting my thoughts here tonight. Uh, it's getting late. 
and I decided I wanted to keep this doing because I pretty I enjoyed it quite a bit doing the last one. It's it's kind of neat to look back and review this old stuff. And like I said before, especially we we've had I mean shoot since this video. I think by the time I shot this video, I want to say I don't even think I was I don't think I was quite to a thousand viewers yet. And we're over 27,000 now and climbing. So there's a lot of these videos that are buried in the archives that are quite a bit harder to find. If you're new here and you are looking to see these, go back through the uh, timber framing vlog playlist and you can find most of these. And that is something I need to do is go through a lot of my playlist, reorganize things of that nature and just... Uh, get after it so things are a little bit easier to find. We crossed over the 600 video mark on this channel. So <laughs> 600 nights of editing, all that good stuff. 600 days of running the camera. Now a lot of you who contact me privately about building these timber frames, a lot of you are interested in starting a YouTube channel. And I think one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is really watch don't let the camera interfere with getting your project done I will warn you that it adds so much time onto the onto the work that needs to be done moving the camera around now this is one of my earlier videos and you see the camera didn't move much but I learned as I've gone along that it's a lot nicer to move the camera around it makes the viewing experience a little bit better I mean unfortunately if you want to grow your audience you do have to do things to make the video the production value decent so moving along this was another video a little bit after that last video clips you were just seeing in this video we were talking about uh, timber selection floor joist selection things like that and I was showing some of the spots, some of the things to look for, I guess, to, uh, to avoid. Now there you saw some pretty good grain run out on this. This is a five by eight floor joist. Now these I actually did not mill. I had these uh, milled up by the Amish and they use an old circle mill that's kind of out of whack. So things are kind of out of square. The consistency is not quite there from one end to the other but they were good enough for what we were doing uh, they did not box the heartwood we have covered that at nauseum on the channel when, when we're milling our timbers for the frames and we're going to do it all over again on the next project so anything that i didn't explain very well through this last series i'm going to really work on explaining it even better coming up in the next couple of projects Honestly, I was worried throughout the course of this series here that people get kind of bored seeing the same thing over and over. Oh, there's some ring shake. And that right there is something that really important to watch for when those growth rings separate. And when you get a timber like that, do not use it. Yeah, that one was pretty bad. A lot of times you get that based on where the tree is growing, what kind of stresses are on it, especially things like hemlock. You don't see it as much in white pine, and that's what this is here, but you, you do see it once in a while. A lot of times it's growing somewhere where there's constant wind, constant movement, and the tree doesn't have much shelter or protection. So obviously that's something to watch for. Man, whoever was running the camera on this one... <laughs> He really needed to learn what the hell he was doing. Yeah, and there's the pit of despair that we've talked about so many times and a little fort my kids built out of some very good pressure-treated lumber they decided to use when I was at work. But I guess you'll have that when you have kids. And that right there is an example of timber wane. Or, uh, so when you're milling your timber and you leave a little bit of that bark edge on there, that's called wane, W-A-N-E. Now, it's not your useless brother-in-law, Wayne, living on your couch who doesn't have a job and doesn't plan to get one. It's just a totally different term. Now, let's see. What else can we cover here? And we're just walking around the pile, shaking the camera all over the place, showing you some bark inclusions, and you can see where that piece right there could be an issue because see how it splits off. 
Now, granted, where that's located on this particular timber isn't too bad. And notice, you can see where it goes through, but see where that heartwood is. That heartwood is up to the upper left-hand corner. The sapwood's pretty close there, but the way that those rings are, that is a really good example of an unstable timber to use. You don't want that. You want that heartwood boxed or you want it completely free of heartwood, one or the other. And the idea being when you box that heartwood center as best you can, that one's a much better example right there. When you center that heartwood and that timber starts to check, and they will check, a lot of times it'll stop checking at the heartwood and you still have a decently solid and strong timber. If you get that heartwood off to the side or up in a corner or something like that, or you get it too close to the edge, that thing checks, it has a good chance of going all the way through and all of a sudden you have an unstable timber. Boy, these were nice when they were new, weren't they? And there's a good example right there where you can see the marks from the circle mill. It's always a big distinction when you're uh, looking to see if something was done with a band mill or with a circle mill. You have those radiuses on your boards and a, and a band mill leaves things much, much smoother. So when you're running a circle mill and you want to have finished timbers, a lot of times you need to plane them off because they're too rough. You know, you can't clean them or anything like that. And a lot of times with a band mill, believe it or not, it cuts smooth enough to where it's not as, as big of a deal. So here, I was cutting a reduction by hand with a hand saw, not a ripping saw, which I need to invest in a good old ripping saw. Everything I have here is crosscut saws, and they do make the job a lot longer when you're trying to cut something like that. Now that reduction was for the very center floor joist in every bent because they're over top of the big, the, uh, the four foot long scarf joints. And I didn't want to cut through both halves of the scarf joint to be able to put these joists in. Now you angle those cuts like that because if you have a sharp 90 degree angle where you make that housing, that is a really good candidate for that thing to split along the growth rings or the, along the grain. So that's something to be aware of. That's why when you see reductions and things like that, you always see it an angled edge right where my finger is running down. It doesn't have to be that pronounced, but just be aware that it is something that does need to be done. And of course that knot right there is in a horrible spot. You know, I was at the point through a lot of this project where I was running low on materials, running low on funds. That's why it took, that was a big reason why that barn took so long to build. Because what would happen, I didn't have access to the logs that I needed all the time. Uh, the big thing that saved this project was finding that place to cut uh, about an hour south of me where I was going to the woods. You guys saw that in some of the videos. And we were doing our own logging. I had the, uh, the property owner's backhoe out there, and I paid stumpage. I paid, uh, I want to say, 200 bucks per mega board foot, uh, and that was based on the small end of the taper of the logs, and those guys were phenomenal to deal with. I mean, they let me use their equipment. They helped me load stuff. They were great, and it really allowed me to get this project done. <laughs> I tell you what, watching these videos now, watching me monkeying around on these open timbers, stuff like that, <laughs> I cannot believe. I can't believe I didn't get hurt on this project sooner than I did. I mean, we were almost done with the big timber work when I fell off of this thing, and uh, which was kind of a freak accident. and something I don't care to ever do again, but I tell you what, it makes you a lot more careful in your day-to-day -day things that you're doing. But... It was so much fun doing this project. The only thing, the only complaint I really have is it was so piecemeal, but this building's big. I mean, it's just about a 3,000 square foot shop if you put the two floors together. So there was quite a bit there. And uh, I didn't draw any plans for it as most of you know. I did this thing all out of my head and 
I think it worked out pretty well, but man, do I miss those timbers being nice and bright. They got weathered so bad, and this thing sat open for so long. Fortunately, I have my shop now, I have my building, the next timber frames we build, they don't have to stand out there and get weathered like that. We can actually get them all done. So, anyway, I think we're gonna about call it a day on this one. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. We're gonna try to do this once a week at least. So, take it easy everybody, and I'll see you on the next video.